Friends, it's a joy to be back with you again here tonight. Thank you so much for coming along. And uh, Margaret, my wife, is here, and she was looking forward to being back again to Bray Hill. Uh, I want shortly to read some verses of Scripture and then something from another book. Uh, but before I, I do that, uh, if you were here last night, I was talking on the subject of ecumenism, and I laid out for you the roots how in the 19th century uh, Orthodox biblical Christianity came under attack from various quarters. There was higher criticism uh, of the Bible. There was the theory of evolution, which was poo-pooing uh, creation. Uh, and then, of course, there was the attempt to Romanize, if you like, the Church of England through the efforts of John Henry Newman. And although those things uh, didn't make much headway, there were a group of evangelicals who banded together and formed the Evangelical Alliance. But as with so many sound organizations, there were also those within their ranks who were of a more liberal disposition, and they were wanting to allow uh, sort of Anglo-Catholic influence in. But they didn't make much headway, so uh, they eventually left, uh, but they concentrated their efforts then in trying to liberalize uh, missionary conferences, and uh, the Edinburgh Conference in 1910 really marked the start of the liberalization of organizations that hitherto had been very sound. And uh, this moved on until you eventually had the World Council of Churches, and initially Rome took no part in it, and some people or groups who joined it left. Uh, so the whole ecumenical movement was faltering very much. Uh, but then in the 1960s, new life, if you like, was breathed into it. And I mentioned the two main reasons. Uh, one was there was a change of attitude by the Roman Catholic Church towards ecumenism, uh, thanks to the efforts of Pope John Paul XXIII and the Vatican Council. They changed their stance and they sought to welcome ecumenism, of course, but it's on their terms. So that was one influence. And then the other influence was the emergence of the modern charismatic movement because it moved across the denominations. And so uh, so-called Protestants who claimed to have had this uh, miraculous baptism of the Spirit after supposedly being converted, they thought, well, if I've had that and my Roman Catholic friend has had it, well, then there's really nothing to stop us getting together. Uh, and so uh, that breathed new life into it, and it led to what I called a doctrinal deviation, Rome was very much to the fore in that, and experiential error and the charismatic movement was very much to the fore in that. And then I cited many examples of the reality of ecumenism in action. And then eventually I came to the rejection. I showed quite clearly that the Word of God teaches that we are to separate from anything that is not faithful to the Word of God. And I mentioned, uh, too, that uh, that great preacher uh, of a bygone era, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he came to a point where he had to separate from John Stott and J.I. Packer, who were supposedly leading evangelicals in the Anglican Church, because they were keen to foster this ecumenism, and Martin Lloyd-Jones could not go down that road, and he, so he broke fellowship with them. And uh, before I do the readings, I want to read something that Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, and I think it sums up really what I was saying last night. He said this, is there anything more characteristic of the church today, this is in the 1960s, than doctrinal confusion, doctrinal indifference, a lack of concern, and a lack of interest? And then perhaps the most alarming of all, the increase in the power, influence, and numbers of the Church of Rome and the Romanizing tendencies that are coming into and being extolled in the Protestant Church. There is an obvious tendency to return to the pre-Reformation position. Ceremonies and ritual are increasing, and the Word of God is being preached less and less. Sermons are becoming shorter and shorter. There is an indifference to true doctrine. I suggest that at the present time, we are really engaged in a great struggle for the very life of the Christian church, for the essence of the Christian faith. We are fighting for the very things that were gained by that tremendous movement of 400 years ago. 
We should be concerned about this. And that was, I think, a, a visionary uh, understanding of the times by Martin Lloyd-Jones back in the 60s and so on. But an additional concern that I would actually add to this was the growing acceptance within certain sections of professing Protestantism that the Pope of Rome is a Christian. In America, you have somebody like Rick Warren, hailed as a so-called evangelical. Nothing could be further from the truth. But he regards the Pope as a Christian. But moving closer to home, you only have to regularly read the column of Alf McCreary in the Belfast Telegraph. And just last Saturday, he had a wee item on his page, and the heading was, Pope Francis is a true Christian. And this is what he said. A new movie on Pope Francis has been receiving rave reviews at the Cannes Film Festival. In Pope Francis, a man of his word, not God's word, as we see up above me, the pontiff emerges as a strong character who is not afraid to lecture cardinals on their shortcomings. He also criticizes the U.S. Congress over its role in the lucrative arms trade. I feel sorry for those of limited outlook who cannot recognize a great Christian when they see one. Well, I've been called many things, but someone of limited outlook, well, that's a new one for me. But I wear it with pride, I can tell you. So, as I say, that's just a little of the background to last night. So, as we come uh, to tonight, I want to first of all turn to Paul's letter to the Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians, and I want to read some verses uh, from chapter 1 and then some verses from chapter 2. Uh, in Colossians chapter 1, Paul has been praising God the Father for his sending of his Son into the world to save sinners, and in verse 14, referring to Christ, Paul writes this, Colossians 1 verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And then going to chapter 2 and beginning at verse 4. Paul writes, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, Yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ." Those are wonderful words from the Apostle Paul. And in those portions of Scripture, they pointed to a person. They pointed to his position as head of the church. They pointed to his perfection. And they pointed to his preeminence. Christ was the preeminent one in those writings of Paul. Now, my second reading is from the 1994 Catechism of the Catholic Church. And you won't have this, so I'll just have to read it to you. 
So you're going to have to take my word that paragraph 882 says the following. The heading is the Pope. Bishop of Rome and Peter's successor is the perpetual and visible source and foundation of the unity both of the bishops and of the whole company of the faithful. For the Roman pontiff, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire church, has full, supreme and universal power over the whole church a power which he can always exercise unhindered. So in that paragraph, we again see a person. We see power being ascribed to him. We see a position of preeminence being ascribed to him. He has been given power and authority that belongs alone to the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in 1998, uh, my good friend in America, Rob Zins, a fellow contender, and incidentally, tomorrow week, he's getting married in Charlotte in North Carolina, and I've been invited to preach at his wedding, so I would greatly value your prayers for that. I fly out from Dublin on Tuesday. But anyhow, back in 1998, Rob invited me to partner him in a debate with two supposedly former evangelicals who had converted to Roman Catholicism, Robert Syngenis and Scott Butler. And we did two debates, and one of them was on the portion of this uh, paragraph from the catechism that I've just read out. The motion was, the Roman pontiff, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire church, has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church. Now, this may come as a shock to you, but I stood in opposition to that proposal and that motion. But it showed you that Rome ascribes a power and a position to someone who is not entitled to it. Now tonight I want to look at our subject of the papacy uh, under this. I want to bring before you two things that the scriptures prohibit in relation to the papacy and two things that the scriptures predict in relation to this, the papacy. So two things that are prohibited and two things that are predicted. So firstly, I believe the scriptures prohibit the thought of the papacy. When I say the thought, I mean the very idea and the very concept of the papacy. We have to recognize that the Pope is a supreme commander of a whole army. Uh, a bit like General Eisenhower was the supreme commander of all the forces that were going to invade uh, France uh, on D-Day. Well, so the Pope, he's in charge of a whole army. And he's the supreme commander. And then below him, if you like, are the, the top brass. Uh, there's the, the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, and the monsignors. And then you have the foot soldiers, which is this whole army of priests dotted all around the world. And while some of the, the priests, if you like, are mere Catholic curates, many other priests are in separate regiments within this army, if you like. Uh, there are various orders of priests. Uh, you have the Franciscans and the Dominicans, the, the Benedictines and the Redemptorists. And I suppose the stormtroopers would actually be the Society of Jesus. And I'm talking about the Jesuits. The Jesuits that were formed with the sole aim of seeking to overturn the Reformation. And the uh, general who's in charge of the Jesuits, he is next to the Pope, the most powerful man in the Vatican. In fact, he's often referred to as the Black Pope. So you have this huge priesthood that has been established within the Roman Catholic religion. Well, I believe that the scriptures prohibit and reject the particular priesthood that Rome has established, that Rome claims is under the authority of the Pope, the successor of Peter. This is a priesthood that when men are uh, inducted into the priesthood, they believe they are given the power to absolve people from their sins 
and also to perform the sacrifice of the Mass. This is a Mass which they claim is a propitiatory sacrifice for the sins of the living and the dead. In other words, they claim that it appeases and turns away the anger of God against sinners, some who are alive and some who are actually dead. So this particular priesthood, I believe, is prohibited by the Scriptures. Uh, back in 1867, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, in the then edition of the Sword and Trial, he made five points which I think are very relevant. First point, no person in the Christian church, whether he be an apostle, an elder, or an evangelist, is ever spoken of in the New Testament as a priest. Nor do we find the most distant allusion to the appointment of an order of priesthood. And he has in mind the Roman Catholic priesthood, the sin-pardoning, sacrifice-offering priesthood. So that was the first point Mr. Spurgeon made. Second point, for the work of the ministry, Christ, quote, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Ephesians 4, verse 11. But never do we read of his giving priests. Thirdly, the apostle wrote to Timothy and Titus particular directions relative to the appointment of bishops, deacons, but no mention is made of priests. Fourthly, the scriptures distinctly teach that all believers by virtue of their union with the Lord Jesus Christ are made kings and priests unto God, a holy and a royal priesthood. 1 Peter and Revelation 1. And this royal priesthood that you and I belong to, we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews tells us we are to offer the sacrifice of our lips. The book of Romans tells us that we are to present our bodies on a daily basis as a living sacrifice for service to our God. Fifth point, it clearly follows that a humanly appointed order of priesthood is a deceptive invention of man and directly opposed to the teaching of Holy Scripture. So the Scriptures clearly reject any notion of the particular priesthood supposedly under the authority of the Pope, the successor of Peter. A second point I want to make is the Scriptures reject the papal power which has been ascribed uh, by Rome to the Pope. Uh, when several of the disciples were sort of debating amongst themselves who was going to be the greatest, uh, in Mark chapter 9, the Lord said to them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And in the following chapter, he actually uh, rammed home that point in Mark chapter 10. He said this, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many." In the Gentile world, you had those who lorded it over the minions, if you like. But he said, if you're going to be a disciple of mine, you are not to behave like that. And he cited his own earthly life as the very example that they were to uh, imitate. When the infant church needed deacons, we read that the 12 disciples met with the rest of the church. And they instructed them to seek out suitable men for the post. No one disciple took it upon himself to say, I'll, I'll make the decision. It was a corporate decision, if you like. And yet in the Roman Catholic Church, if there's new cardinals going to be appointed, the Pope's the man who chooses them. And this is done on a regular basis. Uh, when a delegation needed to be sent to Samaria, both Peter and John were sent and they ministered jointly together. None of them took the lead. And in Acts 8, 25, we read, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem. There was no uh, superior and inferior. They were joint. 
at the very council of Jerusalem that we read about in Acts chapter 15, Peter is simply one of a number of contributors. And at the end of the council, a statement was issued. And it was on behalf of everyone. It was, if you like, a joint communique. It wasn't a papal bull. Paragraph 880 of this catechism says this. When Christ instituted the twelve, he constituted them in the form of a college or permanent assembly at the head of which he placed Peter, chosen from among them. Well, if that were true, which I don't believe it to be true, well, the Apostle Paul didn't take a blind bit of notice of it. For we read in Galatians 2 and verse 11, he, that is Paul, withstood him, that is Peter, to the face, because he, that is Peter, was to be blamed. So much for Peter's supposed universal power. And then when Paul was taking his leave of the elders at the church in Ephesus, he said this to them in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. No supposed universal pastor there for Peter. It's interesting to note that Pope Gregory I said this concerning the Apostle Paul. He, that is Paul, was made head of nations because he obtained the principate of the whole church. Well, that just flies in the face of what Rome teaches about Peter. And Peter, in his own epistles, he never alluded to possessing a position or power that Rome has given to him. In fact, his writings exude the aroma of apostolic humility, if I could put it that way. He wrote in 2 Peter 3, Be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. He didn't say of me and the rest of the gang. It was of us, the apostles. And as for any one elder or group of elders, Peter placed himself on a par with them. He didn't place himself above them. And he said this to them, feed the flock of God, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, neither is being lords over God's heritage. There's never any suggestion in what Peter wrote that he was the top cat, if you like, and all the rest were underlings. So the scriptures, by their rejection of the Roman Catholic allegiance to a particular priesthood and to papal power, they prohibit the thought of the papacy. Then secondly, the scriptures prohibit the titles of the papacy. Isaiah 42 verse 6 says this, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. The triune God revealed in Scripture, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, guards his name, his glory, his praise jealously. He will not allow anyone else to receive glory that is due alone to him. Only once in the Scriptures is the expression Holy Father used. And it's used by the Lord in his great high priestly prayer of John 17 when he's praying to his heavenly Father in earth. And yet this is a title that the Pope is happy to receive, the Holy Father. And of course in Matthew 23, the Lord instructed his followers and call no man your father upon the earth for one is your father which is in heaven. Well, if the Lord's opposed to calling spiritually any man father, how much more outraged must he be for someone to take to himself the title Holy Father? I have no doubt that God the Father in heaven is outraged when a mere sinful mortal man allows himself to be called Holy Father. And in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, Paul declares quite unambiguously there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. The only one who can bridge the chasm that separates sinful man from a holy God 
is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the bridge builder between humanity and his heavenly Father. But yet another title that's taken by the Pope is Pontifex Maximus. And that means the supreme bridge builder. Uh, This is a good example of the uh, influence and infiltration of pagan religion into uh, the Roman Catholic religion. Because the the pagan priests of ancient Rome, they were the, the guardians of the bridges over the Tiber. And that's where that title comes from. Uh, Pope Damasus in 378 was the first pope to accept this title of Pontifex Maximus. And the inscription is found in various locations dotted around the Vatican. Uh, It's uh, above the entry into St. Peter's, and then it's above the actual statue of St. Peter. And then it's above the Holy Year door. Uh, This is a door in St. Peter's which is only opened on special occasions Jubilee years, which could be every 25 years or every 50 years, or maybe on a special year if a pope declares it. And they open that door. And the thing is that it's a good moneymaker because Roman Catholics, to get a special plenary indulgence, which is the forgiveness due for all of their temporal sins, if they make a pilgrimage to Rome, and go through this open door, then supposedly all the temporal punishment for their sins is wiped out. Well, my Bible tells me that the Lord said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. But by taking this title of Pontifax Maximus, the Pope has robbed the Lord Jesus Christ of a role that belongs to him. Uh, In the proposal that was debated uh, in Fresno 20 years ago, uh, the word pontiff appears in what's written there. And uh, in this pocket Catholic dictionary, which is drawn up by a Jesuit called John Harden, so it's fully uh, accepted by the Roman Catholic Church, it says this about pontiff. It defines it as high priest now reserved as the title of the Pope. So the Pope as the high priest as far as Roman Catholics are concerned. But again, Rome has taken a title that belongs exclusively to the Lord Jesus Christ and given it to the Pope. For in Hebrews chapter 5, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ is described as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And in chapter 7, we learn that he has an unchangeable priesthood, which means that it can't be transferred to anybody else. Well, why is that the situation? Well, in the Old Testament, the high priest died, and then they had to be replaced. But our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven lives in the power of an endless life, and so he continues onwardly as our great high priest, and he ever lives to make intercession for us. There's only one great high priest, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, again, the papacy has robbed uh, the Lord Jesus Christ of a title that belongs to him. Then, referring again to the wording of the proposal that was debated in Fresno, uh, we find that the Pope is referred to as the Vicar of Christ. Uh, At a Roman council held in 495 AD, uh, Pope Galatius asserted this. To the see of Rome belonged the primacy in virtue of Christ's own delegation and that from the authority of the keys there was accepted none living but only the dead. In other words, supposedly Christ delegated all this power to the head of the Roman church, the Pope. And uh, the council, when they were winding up, they shouted out in acclamation to Pope Galatius, In thee we behold Christ's vicar. Now, up until the death of Pope Paul VI in 1978, for centuries beforehand, when a pope was being installed, great ceremony and so on, at one point he received a tiara, a three-tier tiara crown. A cardinal placed it on his head. 
And these were the words that were used. Receive the tiara adorned with three crowns, and know that thou art the father of princes and kings, the ruler of the world, the vicar of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, as I say, after the death of Pope Paul VI in 1978, subsequent popes didn't allow that part of the ceremony to take place. And I think that reflects the ecumenical makeover because John Paul, or Pope John XXIII convened the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council, but he died during its tenure and Pope Paul VI he oversaw the closing of the Vatican Council, and then he died. And when he died, obviously the successors thought, well, if we were to have this crowning ceremony with all of these sorts of words, that really wouldn't do ecumenical relations a lot of good. So they probably have the, the tiara crowned in cold storage somewhere in the Vatican. And rest assured that in the proper circumstances, I have no doubt that it would be reintroduced back into the crowning ceremony of the popes. But what lofty titles were given to the pope. What a contrast with the psalmist who wrote in Psalm 115 and verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. So, this title of vicar, what does the word vicar actually mean? It means a personally appointed substitute or representative. Well, is the Pope God's personally appointed substitute or representative? Absolutely not. Because the Lord Jesus Christ told us who would be God's appointed representative and substitute here on earth. He told his disciples that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. That is the true vicar of Christ here upon the earth, God the Holy Ghost. So you can see that the papacy has appropriated to itself titles that belong alone to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost spirit. It's no wonder that uh, Pope Leo XIII told followers that he upon this earth has the place of God. That is the lofty claims that popes have made for themselves in the past. Listen to these quotes. Pope Innocent III he said, we may, according to the fullness of our power, dispose of the law and dispense above the law. Those whom the Pope of Rome doth separate, it is not a man that separates them, but God. For the Pope holdeth place on earth, not simply of a man, but of the true God. Pope Nicholas said this, I am all in all and above all, so that God himself and I, vicar of God, hath both one consistory. And I am able to do almost all that God can do. Wherefore, if those things that I do be said not to be done of man, but of God, what can you make me but God? And then at the Lateran Council, uh, a man called Marcellus, he was uh, delivering an oration to Pope Julius II, and this is how he phrased part of it. Take care that we lose not that salvation, that life and breath which thou hast given us. For thou art our shepherd, thou art physician, thou art governor, thou art husbandman, thou finally art another God on earth. These quotations are all documented as accurate. So listening to them... I'm drawn back to Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. The greatest earthly king of Old Testament Israel was David. And this is what he said in 1 Chronicles 29, 10, and 11. Wherefore, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, 
Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. What a contrast that to the headship claimed by the papacy. David truly was a man after God's own heart. So the scriptures prohibit the thought of the papacy and the scriptures prohibit the titles of the papacy. I want to move on now to two things that the scriptures predict. Firstly, in John chapter 10 and verse 1, the Lord said this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. And, and over centuries, the teachings of the papacy have served to place it in the role that the Lord has just referred to. The papacy and their teaching have shown themselves to be thieves and robbers. And the one who has been victim of robbery, again, is the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, concerning righteousness. The scriptures teach that Christ alone was immaculately conceived without sin. Because the instrument, if you like, in his conception was the Holy Ghost. So he was not a son of Adam. Therefore, he was not born under condemnation because of Adam's sin. He was immaculately conceived. And of course, he lived a sinless life. However, in December 1854, Pope Pius IX, he said this. The most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. So the Pope declared at the First Vatican Council that Mary was immaculately conceived without sin. And Pope John Paul II Uh, In more recent times, uh, he was quite happy to be associated with that teaching because this catechism, uh, which was brought out during his time as Pope, he wrote the foreword to it and he said, I declare it to be a sure norm for teaching the faith. So not only do the scriptures teach that Christ was born without sin, But they also teach that he lived without sin. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And unlike all other people, including Mary, who have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, the scriptures attest to the unique, all-dimensional sinlessness of Christ alone. John said, in him is no sin, Peter said that he did no sin. Paul wrote that he knew no sin. And Hebrews tells us he was without sin. But the Catechism says, By the grace of God, Mary remained free of every personal sin her whole life long. So, the unique righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rome has robbed Christ of it and robed Mary in it. And secondly, what about redemption? Well, the New Testament scriptures teach clearly that Christ alone is the only redeemer. And what better person to turn to than Peter? For as much as you know that you're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. Christ alone is the unique sinless redeemer. Christ's blood alone is the unique accepted sacrifice. However, once more, when you read the teachings of the papacy, they rob Christ. Pope Benedict XV wrote, Mary suffered and as it were nearly died with her suffering son. For the salvation of mankind, she renounced her mother's rights, and as far as it depended on her, 
offered her son to placate divine justice, so we may well say that she with Christ redeemed mankind. So he says that she offered Christ. 20 years ago, I took part in a half-hour TV debate on Channel 4 uh, with a Jesuit priest called Richard Foley, and he, the, the subject matter was should Mary be declared co-redemptrix? And he was talking about, and he said, there's Mary, and she was on Calvary, and she, uh, she was saying, there is my son, I offer him up to you, take him and take him. And I just simply said, show me that from the scriptures. He said, it's not in the scriptures. I made my point. Pope Pius XII wrote, she, that is Mary, it was who, immune from all sin, personal or inherited, and ever more closely united with her son, offered him on Golgotha to the eternal father. And the same Pius XII said of Mary that she had a part with him in the redemption of the human race. Pope John Paul II wrote, it was on Calvary that Mary's suffering beside the suffering of Jesus reached an intensity which can hardly be imagined from a human point of view, but which was mysteriously and supernaturally fruitful for the redemption of the world. These are false teachings. And the verse that I used to respond to Mr. Foley in the TV debate was this. Hebrews 9 verse 14. Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. The only one who offered Christ up on the cross of Calvary was Christ himself who offered himself. But there we go. We find a unique redeemer and a unique sacrifice and it belongs to Christ alone. And what about intercession? Rome is not just content to rob him of his unique righteousness and robe Mary in it, to rob him of his unique redemptive work and ascribe uh, a part in it to Mary. But they do the same when it comes to his heavenly intercessory work. Paragraph 969 of the Catechism. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the church under the titles of Advocate, Helper, Benefactress, and Mediatrix. Well, I've already dealt with the subject of mediator and mediatrix. There's no room for a mediatrix. There's one mediator between God and man. But what about the teaching in the Catechism, that of Mary being Advocate? Well, again, the Scriptures totally reject such a notion. And we read in 1 John 2, verse 1, and by the way, John was the very one into whose care Mary was entrusted by the Lord when he was dying on the cross. And John wrote this, My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You see, it's only on the basis of his perfect righteousness and redemption that he can stand as the advocate for his redeemed people. He pleads our cause before the throne of heaven. Satan would seek to accuse when we sin, but Christ interposes and says, this person belongs to me. And that is very reassuring, I can tell you. So John 10, 1 predicted the coming of robbers and thieves and the teachings of the papacy clearly put them in that position. They have robbed Christ of his unique righteousness, his unique redemption, and his unique intercessory work. The scriptures predict the teaching of the papacy. And then the scriptures predict the track record of the papacy. There are a number of features about the track record of the papacy that the scriptures predicted. In Matthew 24, the Lord warns his followers against deception and false prophets. And then he makes this significant statement in verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Well, we've already found that the popes have taken the title 
vicar of Christ and they've made outrageous claims about being very God on earth. Uh, here's another one, Pope Pius the Ninth. he said this, I alone, despite my unworthiness, am the successor of the apostles, the vicar of Jesus Christ. I alone have the mission to guide and direct the bark of Peter. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, the same Pius the Ninth, uh, during the first Vatican Council, a report was issued in January 1870, and it said this. The Pope is Christ in office, Christ in jurisdiction and power. We bow down, O pious, as before the voice of Christ, the God of truth. In clinging to thee, we cling to Christ. In 1890, the Bishop of Laval and Monsignor Bougeau, he wrote this. The Pope is Jesus Christ hidden under a veil. He is as the host upon our altars, the Pope is the second manner of the real presence of Jesus Christ. And a French newspaper reported in 1893 that Cardinal Sarto, who eventually went on to be Pope Pius X, in St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice, he said this, the Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself under the veil of flesh. So many popes have come and gone and readily accepted and used this title vicar of Christ and described themselves or been described as God upon earth. But sadly, there was a, a second many in that verse that I quoted from Matthew 24. It says, many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many. And the many who are deceived, unfortunately, are the dear Roman Catholic people who have truly been greatly deceived by the ongoing occupants of the role of Pope. So that was the first feature predicted, the many. The second feature predicted is the man. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, Paul spoke of the man of sin who will be revealed. And in verse 4, he says how this man will conduct himself he says, this man opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, I've already given you many examples of the claims made by popes and their followers. So this man truly was exalting himself virtually above all that is God. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says this, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it whithersoever he will. However, according to Pope Gregory VII, such power belongs to the papacy. For he said in 1080, We desire to show to the world that we can give or take away at our will kingdoms, duchies, earldoms, in a word, the possessions of all men. Pope Innocent III declared that God had ordained the Pope to have power over all nations and kingdoms, to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Pope Boniface VIII, he summed it up with these words. The Pope is of so great dignity and power that he constitutes one and the same tribunal with Christ, so whatever the Pope does seems to proceed from the mouth of God. The Pope is God on earth. And history teaches that when it was expedient, the papacy exercised that power. I showed you the book, The Papacy, by the Reverend Wiley last night that had won a prize from Evangelical Alliance in 1851. Well, in that book, Mr. Wiley wrote this. History presents us with a list of not less than 64 emperors and kings deposed by the popes. Some people say the papacy has changed, but they should bear in mind what Mr. Wiley also wrote in that book. He says, though the Church of Rome is silent on her claims meanwhile, we are not warranted to take that silence for surrender. They are not claims renounced. They are simply claims not asserted. 
And that has great relevance for the Tiara Crown. It's just because they don't use it anymore doesn't mean that they've renounced the claims made when it was used in the past. And if the right time comes in the future, they'll get it out of wherever they have it stashed away. The man that Paul spoke of in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, he was not even referred to as that man of sin, but also as the son of perdition. The expression son of perdition is used of only one other person in the scriptures, and that was Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was apparently a bishop. Acts 1 verse 20 speaks of his bishopric. Judas Iscariot had the bag, in other words, he controlled the finances. Well, the Vatican is one of the richest organizations upon earth. Judas Iscariot, Iscariot betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ with a kiss. And as popes globe trot around the world, when they get off the plane and go down to the bottom of the steps, a lot of them, the first thing they do is kiss the ground. And they are kissing the enemies of Christ too. Uh, no doubt, uh, David Wilson on Sunday, when he's talking about the one world church is coming, he'll talk about how there's a great attempt to fuse all religions together. And heading the charge for that is the papacy. Uh, because I could read you greetings that they sent uh, on the 20th of April this year. They sent, Dear Muslim brothers and sisters, in his providence, God the Almighty has granted you the opportunity to observe anew the fasting of Ramadan. And uh, we conclude by renewing our best wishes for a fruitful fast. And then uh, just uh, a day or two ago, they uh, sent warm greetings to a delegation of Buddhists. Uh, the Holy Father's words, I'm quoting what they wrote. He's not my Holy Father. I offer you a warm welcome and I thank you for the precious gift of your sacred book translated into today's language by the monks of Wat Pho Temple. It is my heartfelt wish that Buddhists and Catholics will grow increasingly closer, advance in knowledge of one another and so on and so forth. And then of course, uh, each October, they will send greetings to the Hindus for their celebration of Diwali, which is a Hindu festival of lights. So he's a traitor. The papacy is treacherous. They are betraying the truth that the Lord Jesus Christ alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And they're betraying their supposed first pope who said, neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given under heaven amongst men whereby man can be saved. The third feature that is predicted is the martyrs. Revelation 17 tells of a woman arrayed in purple and scarlet. The woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs. History is littered with details of the butchery that has been perpetrated at the behest of the papacy on behalf of the Roman Catholic religion. Uh, Halley's Pocket Bible Handbook records much of this. The Albigenses priest against the immoralities of the Catholic priesthood. Pilgrimages, worship of saints and images. They opposed the claims of the Church of Rome. They made great use of scriptures. In 1208, a crusade was ordered by Pope Innocent III. A bloody war of extermination followed. Within 100 years, the Albigenses were utterly rooted out. And one of the leaders of the Pope's army said, Neither sex nor age nor rank have we spared. We have put all alike to the sword. In the city of Bezir, Pope Innocent III referred to what happened there as the crowning achievement of his papacy. Between 1540 and 1570, no fewer than 900,000 Protestants were put to death in the extermination of the Waldenses. In August 1572, the Protestant Huguenots in France were massacred in what's known as the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. And Pope Gregory XIII, he commemorated the event with a medal. He had his own image on one side, and then on the image were men, on the other side were men and women being put to death by an angel with a sword. And there is one other example I want to give, and that was Rome's treatment 
of John Wycliffe, often referred to as the Morning Star of the Reformation. He rejected crucial Roman Catholic heresies such as transubstantiation, confession, purgatory, and so on and so forth. Some 30 years after his death, he was condemned as a heretic by the Synod of Constance. And an order was made that his bones should be dug up, burned, and thrown into a river. And that is what happened in due course. Even the grave didn't afford him any protection against the fury and wrath of Rome. So the many, the man, the martyrs, these features are clearly predicted in the scriptures and they find their fulfillment in the track record of the papacy. The scriptures prohibit the thought of the papacy. They prohibit the titles of the papacy. They predict the teaching of the papacy and they predict the track record of the papacy. As you have heard, Rome believes that the pontiff is the pastor and has universal power over the whole of the church. Paragraph 870 of his catechism says, The sole church of Christ, which in the creed we profess to be one holy, Catholic, and apostolic, subsists in the Catholic church, which is governed by the successor of Peter. Let me give you two quotes from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He said, of all the dreams that ever deluded men and probably of all blasphemies that ever were uttered, there has never been one which is more absurd and which is more fruitful in all manner of mischief than the idea that the Bishop of Rome can be the head of the Church of Jesus Christ. No, these popes die, and how could the Church live if its head were dead? The true head ever lives, and the Church ever lives in him. And again, Spurgeon wrote, Christ did not redeem his church with his blood that the Pope might come in and steal away the glory. He never came from heaven to earth and poured out his very heart that he might purchase his people, that a poor sinner, a mere man, should be set upon high to be admired by all the nations and to call himself God's representative on earth. Christ has always been the head of the church. And Mr. Wiley, in his book, In the Papacy, he said this, The church so-called of Rome has no right to rank amongst Christian churches. She's not a church. Neither is her religion the Christian religion. The church of Rome bears the same relation to the church of Christ, which the hierarchy of Baal bore to the institute of Moses. Popery is the gospel transubstantiated into the flesh and blood of paganism, under a few of the accidents of Christianity. And I want to give you just another little quote by the Reverend David Samuel, who over many years has been a staunch defender of Protestant biblical truth. Uh, he gave a speech one time, a talk, Rome's strategy for England. And he said this, Rome's aims are and have always been hostile to the Protestantism of this country. She is bent upon the overthrow and elimination of Protestantism. The Church of Rome is a political religious institution. It is not merely a religious institution. It is both political and religious. And I got add, that's just exactly the same as Islam. The official titles ascribed to the Pope are Father of Kings and Princes, the Vicar of Christ, and the Ruler of the World. That is the very nature of the papacy. It is both a religious and political institution, and the Pope is acknowledged to be so sovereign. Cardinal Bellamine, who was one of the greatest authorities on the Church of Rome, said, The fundamental article of the Christian religion is the supremacy of the Roman Pontiff. Every soul must be subject to the Pope, to the papacy. Rome will brook no rivals at all, and she will not be satisfied until Protestantism is destroyed in its doctrines and in its institutions. The strategy of the Church of Rome is the same today as it was in the time of Henry VIII, in the time of Elizabeth I, in the time of the 18th and 19th centuries, namely, to bring our church and nation back into submission to the papacy. Submission is the only term that Rome will recognize. She advances on a wide front and seeks to accomplish her end by various means.
And that sums up very well the aims and objects that the papacy are seeking for. But one last brief point, the meltdown of the papacy. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, it speaks of the revelation of that wicked, and I believe it to be the papacy, and Paul states that the Lord shall consume it with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy it with the brightness of his coming. Yes, I believe there will be a one world church embracing virtually all of the non-Christian religions of the world. But who will be at the head of it all? The Pope. Because they've had prayer meetings at Assisi where all the religious leaders of all the denominations, and there they are standing in a sort of crescent shape on a stage. But who's central? The Pope. He is numero uno. So we should take heart because we know what the end will be. And so I close with the words of John in Revelation 22, verse 20. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen.